I'm uh, Tom Abel. I'm going to kind of go first and we'll do a tag team with uh, Alan Tassel next. Uh, so we're going to do this a little bit differently uh, to follow up this uh, excellent uh, presentation, uh, presentations before with a very broad and thorough. Uh, so we're going to try to talk about some unmet needs. Uh, our, our first slide, I guess, just is titled uh, Unmet Needs. We'll try to share that with you in just a second here. Uh, but also, uh, and we're going to have our disclosures. Uh, we're going to going to also uh, do. There we go. And that needs uh, uh, a survey for anybody that wants. Uh, and there's our disclosures. You can see I have a lot of a lot of miles on me. I've been around the odometer a few times, uh, but uh, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Tansel's. Uh, uh, not as many disclosures, fortunately. Uh, so next slide is going to be about uh, the survey, which we're going to send to you, we hope now. It's uh, actually 12 questions, 10 questions on one survey and two on the other. And uh, there's, there's no identifying information uh, and participation is optional, but our goal is to try to assess what some of the needs are and we hope to share the results. But uh, basically, what we are asking you for is to identify who you are, patient, family member, et cetera, uh, what, your, what your age is, uh, something about gender, education level. And, and then we ask some questions about, are you satisfied with your medical care? Uh, whether you felt uh, you needed care but couldn't receive it. And then some questions about um, uh, recently, uh, if you uh, had trouble getting care, why not? Um, you know, we're interested in what's most lacking in your care. Have you had a hard time uh, getting insurance to pay? And a couple or three last questions about disease from normal life medical conditions that might affect your mental health and biggest unmet needs. Uh, now, you, th those should show up for you. Uh, we'll let you fill them out. The, uh, the hosts and us, don't, we don't vote. Uh, there'll be 10 questions and there'll be another two more questions that will follow up in just a minute. Uh, while we're waiting for that, um, I'm, when we get back to the talk, uh, what we're going to do for the rest of the half hour is go through some slides where we've put uh, down kind of our thoughts for unmet needs. But what really matters is what the unmet needs are for patients. Um, uh, and because it's one thing for us as code experts or some people would say talking heads to think what we, we know what patients need, we don't always know that. Um, we have a lot of experience and a lot of ideas, but that doesn't mean that those uh, ideas are correct with that experience uh, is correct. And I see a note there, yeah, you have to complete question seven, go on to question eight probably. Um, so we'll give you just a little bit longer to complete the poll. And then we'll, as I understand it, and Zoom will be able to uh, uh, show you the results of that. We can, we can all share, uh, which we hope will help us guide us because we'd like to try to uh, get this out to the rest of the uh, com communities and so-called stakeholders, uh, stakeholders uh, that are involved in this, which which I'll mention a little bit, but Dr. Tansel will talk about in, in more detail. Let's see. So we've got the first 10 questions up there, right? And then we've got- We do, more. We do have those. We have the 10 questions up there. Um, if we wanna keep it up a little bit longer, I can um, share awesome. the results and then we can go on to the two questions um, in sure. poll number two. We just couldn't yeah. call 12 in the one poll, so we had to split yeah. them up. <laughs> whenever you think, uh, whenever you think is enough time. 
We're not trying to rush anybody. We still have people answering. So I, okay. I say we'll give them a, how about 30 more seconds and- No, that's fine. Slowly that's coming nice. in. Um, the other thing is when we go through the slides, we've listed some of our ideas, but I also want to share, at least for my for eight, four decades or so of talking with patients, kind of the questions arose out of my experience and Dr. Tanzel's experience and, and the literature's experience of what the unmet needs are. And uh, I would say, um, uh, Dr. Cutts, who some of you know, she's spoken in other early sessions, and I ran uh, about 100 support groups from 1990 to 2000 in Memphis, which was fairly early on. Uh, but um, um, usually they were one to two hours for uh, focus groups, support groups, and we would spend the 30 to 45 minutes basically just hearing uh, the problems patients were having and then we would try uh, 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 to address some of the uh, some of the other issues. So sometimes the MN needs can be, in my experience, so overwhelming that uh, it's kind of like I don't know where to start, uh, but that's 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 why we're doing this today is to try to try to um, try to get a feel for for people. Um, it looks like um, um, we've had everyone stop answering, so I could end the poll now, and we can give the results for this one. Sure, that'd be great. It would be great. So to kind of go th through these, uh, most majority of people are patients, uh, and um, close to the majority are age 20 to 44, which I always consider young. And these days, it's very young. Eh? But my definition of young is anybody younger, very young is anybody younger than I am. Uh, mostly female. Uh, uh, and uh, we've seen this from other polls before. Many of them are well-educated uh, individuals. Uh, people are, I see are somewhat satisfied, which is uh, good. And uh, the uh, other question is uh, about whether people felt they got the health care, felt they need health care, but didn't receive it. Uh, and that's the majority of people. Um, one of the big issues it looks like is availability uh, and most lacking uh, appears to be effective therapies. Um, insurance looks like an issue which we'll talk about and many people are kept from uh, a leading a normal life. So uh, that's Hopeful. Then, can we do the last two, two questions? Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Part two. Okay. They're labeled as one and two. One's eleven and twelve. This is about whether medical condition may have negatively affected your mental health, and and of all the things we talked about, and the things we're talking about today, what are the biggest, uh, biggest unmet needs? if one could uh, choose it, choose just one. And again, none of us are talking or voting, just, just patients and other participants. Okay. What do you think, another? 30 seconds or so. I think that sounds great. Everyone's actively answering. Somebody, so they didn't get the part two question. Hmm. I'm not I'm glad they let us know that. I'm not sure what to do about that if somebody didn't get it. I apologize for that. We know if it can be sent out again. Um, not sure. We can we can try and and see if we can do it again. But I believe once it closes, it closes. Sent. 
hard to answer. Some great, great comments. I love I love it in Zoom we can get these comments. Wonderful. How about we give 20 more seconds? It looks like people are yeah. answering and then we can close the poll. So we're gonna, we're gonna start out talking about patients, providers, insurers, industry, government, and another big part of it's gonna be the health technology people because they often determine what is paid for. Okay, I guess we're getting close, right? Okay. Let's see time. People answering. Oh, okay, good. Well, let everybody finish. That's, I mean, this is all about everybody. Let's see, we had another great question here. And the second part was asking if it's. Um, most effective mental health, most unmet need is emotional. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It looks like we've slowed down. We'll give it three more seconds and let's end great. this poll. Great. great comments. Great results. Wow. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like. Uh, 70% say negatively affected uh, mental health, which is not surprising. And finding specialized healthcare provider seems to be the largest other single single group, but it's wide wide diversity of, of unmet needs. Um, great. Okay. Well, let me um, let me uh, let me close that and uh, uh, Alan. Uh, it won't take long for me, and we've already taken a lot of time for the poll. But I hope I hope everybody uh, 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 that, that participated was willing to, to do it and thought it was useful. It was certainly helpful for Dr. Tansel and I to get a feel. Uh, when we put together, we thought about patients and families, information for online access, finding providers willing to see access to new therapies, and Home health care as well as nutritional issues. That's a lot in one slide, and that's that would be an hour talk right there. But uh, seeing patients over and over uh, so often, uh, they have questions about the illness. Their family has questions, and a lot of times the providers, including myself, can't answer the questions. They're excellent questions. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, the inability to live a normal life, as we heard today, is very common. Reduced quality of life, reduced ability to work need for more effective therapies and gaps between patients and caregiver perceptions. And I remember early on we were working with neuromodulation, we did a, a survey of the SF36 uh, quality of life, a generic quality of life measure. And the higher is better, normal is about 70. Well, our patients came back with zero and I got a call from Europe, this was 20 years ago in 25, we didn't have email really, so it was either call, phone call or fax. I got a call from Europe saying, how could this be? These people, it says they have zero quality of life. And I said, believe me, it is true. Some people have zero quality of life. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, the, for providers, uh, it's very common uh, for us to get questions about proper diagnosis, about good therapies, about ability to refer patients for care and support group contact information. And I want to, uh, to say uh, uh, groups like Ole and, and the other groups uh, that are represented here today are just are, are crucial. And I, everybody I see, I give them lists of support groups. But these days, I don't have to tell them because they're already on the groups. Uh, also, our, as I'll talk later, the uh, Gastroparesis Consortium was set up for the NIH really because of the, the pa tremendous patient need for uh, uh, not only patient information and knowledge, but also providers. So next, next slide is on insurers. Uh, standardized diagnosis is difficult. Evidence-based recommendations for therapy, published outcome data, all are unmet needs from what we can tell. Uh, and uh, industry also, uh, just a couple more slides. Uh, the guidance for clinical trials, there's been some guidance about patient reported outcomes. 
But as Dr. Tansel will talk about, we need better ones. We need to see better agreement on diagnosis, on therapy, and again, good epidemiologic data. Uh, next slide. And I'll say, this is almost my last slide, a couple of things. Uh, the number of patients with gastroparesis is highly debated, but what's hard to dispute is the fact that if you look at the, the, uh, use the uh, NIH promise guidelines for symptoms, uh, almost 10% of the country has the symptoms of gastroparesis at any given time. So it's a lot of patients. Unfortunately, Medicare, for example, doesn't include gastroparesis as one of their diagnoses. So everybody that applies with gastroparesis is automatically going to be rejected. And that ultimately means a political solution that's beyond the scope of this talk. But government needs to know diagnosis, uh, therapies, costs, and know this information. So let me, uh, next slide is, uh, yes, let me turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Tansel, to finish the presentation. Sure. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, so this is just to kind of go over how everybody relates to each other um, and that there are multiple stakeholders um, and they all have a different perspective of the key points. Um, and so there are medicine developers. Um, hold on, sorry. There um, that have public health needs and incentives. Um, and they care more about um, the price and, and predictability of the value of their investment um, in the research um, that they will put into this. Um, and, and then there are HTA bodies, which um, are health technology assessment bodies. In the US, there are multiple um, of these bodies that sort of kind of serve that role. Um, for instance, the US Preventive Service Tax Force, Medicare Evidence Development. So they, there are these bodies and, and they um, think about things more on the national level um, in terms of a national value framework and uh, quantification of relative benefits and uncertainty is really important for them. Um, there's also patients, which was kind of the the main point that Tom and I really wanted to focus on, and that is on there in terms of needs, so disease severity and burden, length of development process and waiting time for patients, um, affordability, accessibility, adequacy of existing treatments. And there are the regulators, um, so uh, that is generally, um, more of a binary decision, yes or no, and they base it on proof of concept, preliminary evidence, benefit, and risk. Uh, ultimately, patient perspectives need to be applied um, into this a little bit more. Um, and finally, payers. So this is more on the national level, emphasis on well-defined patient populations. Um, so for this talk, gastroparesis and the size of the relative relative benefits is important. Um, so, so those are kind of the ways that they kind of think about it. In terms of the disease, gastroparesis, so, so really there are a lot of unmet needs, um, gaps in our current understanding of the natural history of disease, um, defining and achieving optimal treatment goals, improvement of quality of life, um, which I think was very, um, very paramount on the survey as 76% of you completing this felt that you were unable to lead a normal life. So I think that that speaks volumes. Minimizing adverse events, reduction of extent of tissue damage, reduction of hospitalization, reduction of needs for surgery, reduction on intravenous support. Um, and um, for that, early diagnosis and treatment are very important. Reduction in time to diagnosis. Um, it looked like, based on the survey, um, availability and accessibility um, are leading to delays as more than half of the people on the survey didn't see a provider when they felt like they needed it. And 
half of the re half of the time that reason was availability. Um, and 40% of you guys identified finding healthcare providers as a major issue. So I think because of those issues, um, that is probably going to be a way of addressing that reduction in time to diagnosis. Um, and timely and effective interventions have the potential to improve outcomes. Um, so as 38% of you feel, and as certainly Tom and I feel, effective therapies is a, is a pretty important um, area that we really need to be able to focus on um, to help deliver better, better care. And so to help achieve these goals, the goal is always to induce and maintain symptom remission, restore motility if possible, bridge the gap between current healthcare practice and optimal treatment strategies, ways of keeping you guys working healthy, happy, um, not in the hospital. And we really need more accurate biomarkers to assist in selection of, of therapies um, and ideally have treatments that can help improve the natural history. Also patient-focused goals. Um, so most trials are pretty focused on the symptoms of gastroparesis, pain, nausea, vomiting, bloating. Um, but clearly this affects you beyond those symptoms um, into the quality of life issue. Um, and so, so we need to define those endpoints. If, if a precedent, for instance, can keep you from going to the hospital, then that uh, may make it cost effective. So, um, so I think that that is a way of proving and, and, a, and a measure that we need to start measuring when we look at new therapies um, in, in preserving quality of life. Um, patient perspectives and expectations are poorly understood. So the, the point of the survey was just to kind of open the door and, and see how you guys feel. Um, because we, uh, we, I mean, I think the Tom, sense that Tom and I get is we're just not helping you guys the way that we need to. And so, this was to, to kind of open up that discussion on what your unmet needs were. Um, so thank you again for filling out that survey. Um, and I think that this is an important thing that it, in having an active involvement of, of you guys in clinical decision-making to help improve patient satisfaction and, and probably disease outcomes. Um, there was an interesting survey. So this is a survey looking at patients with chronic diseases, 10 common chronic diseases, unfortunately not gastroparesis, but um, I thought it was an interesting point that likely um, may speak um, to you guys in that, and, and, and this was an interesting study looking at, so QUID, which is a data and language analysis platform, and UCB, which is a global biopharmaceutical company, they use natural language processing and machine learning um, in large public forums for chronic disease. And they looked at more than 500,000 de-identified anonymous public comments that occurred in openly accessible digital media from 2010 to 2018. And they looked at medical needs, so needs relating to symptoms, treatment specifics, curing the disease, and emotional needs. Needs related to knowledge, power to make informed decisions, prepare for daily life, how to manage the disease long-term, and community, community engagement. And, and then they rated. So these are the top eight unmet needs based on that in the patients with 10 of the most common chronic diseases. Um, and the first two are more emotional needs, understanding medication side effects and impact on daily life, co coping with living with the condition. Um, and, and then um, really only two were medical needs, identifying and mitigating symptoms, more and better treatment options. But for the most part, the main thing is coping with living with the disease, understanding the disease. Um, so, so really there's this unmet emotional need that we need to better connect with you. Um, and certainly as reflected on the survey, um, being more available, being able to, for you to find us. Um, and so certainly organizations like Olay really give a, a good opportunity with, with a patient advocacy group to really help bridge that gap. So I'm grateful um, to Olay for letting us 
speak to you guys. And thank you so much for being part of that survey. I think that was very interesting.